So I'm on. <laughs> Good. So uh, hi everyone. I'm Jonathan Pino, as we say uh, in uh, in French. I just started a business in uh, back in 2012 of uh, permaculture design. We're gonna see. Uh, uh, all the history about uh, today, the project a project that we did uh, last year on Ferme Quatre Temps, which is uh, Quatre Temps is uh, kind of a, a woodland perennial that gives some uh, edible berries, very uh, good ground cover for uh, forest gardens. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna just share my screen to start that, and this is it. Everyone can see that? Good. So today, permaculture meets market gardening. Uh, Jean-Martin Fortier is, uh, is not with us today. He got uh, lots and lots of work to do on uh, what you see right now uh, on the photo, which are the market gardens that uh, we established back in 2015. And uh, we're gonna uh, see a little bit about that project, what uh, we did as permaculture designers um, with Jean Martin. First, I'm gonna introduce what this is all about. What is the Ferm Quatre Temps project? And uh, I'm gonna see. Uh, we're gonna see a little bit about uh, my history, and then we're gonna get into the really the, the fine details of uh, permaculture design uh, that we did uh, on that system. So let's go. Oh yeah, I didn't. I'm I'm sorry, uh, Rally. I, I didn't, uh, <laughs> still have those uh, mushy transition. But uh, here is uh, the geographical position of the project. It's in Hemingford, uh, uh, Quebec. It's uh, southern Quebec, as you uh, can see uh, on the the border, uh, the yellow border. It's really the most uh, probably uh, the, the most warm climate of Quebec uh, in Hemingford. So we're really into northeastern. Uh, um, I was about to say United States, uh, northeastern uh, America. Uh, so it's really temperate climate. Uh, still, it's uh, the soil here is still frozen. We're about to uh, see the first uh, bud break in maybe few ye uh, few weeks. Um, so it's a 150 acres property uh, designed for uh, a farm that, that is a commercial farm. Uh, very rich man founded the project, uh, and Jean Martin Fortier is the, the farm manager uh, regarding uh, the vegetable product, product production. So what you see here is the northern part of the market gardens. Uh, those market gardens are really. Um, in, in the same framework that uh, Jean Martin Fortier, with uh, if you, maybe few few people know the the book that he published, the market uh, market gardening, if I remember in English, um, and we see uh, the greenhouses there, we see some of the infrastructure, and uh, on the upper part you see the market garden. As uh, Jean-Martin Fortier uh, told in PV3, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. You, uh, to change something, build a new model that takes the existing model obsolete. So that's really the idea of Jean-Martin Fortier taking that project. Uh, it was really uh, set up with uh, Les Jardins La Grelinette, which is uh, the, the farm that, it, that he started back in uh, you know, 12 years ago. Uh, with uh, his wife, and uh, he really created a new model that uh, it, that is, from what I understand, is really one of the big part of why he's so famous here is that he have a uh, he has an economic economic model that works, and also he have an ecological model that works too. So Jean Martin, um, with that project, with that uh, Richmond, wanted to that want to have you know a bigger farm uh, and trying to reproduce the best practices and ideas that are uh, in the um, ecological and organic farming right now. Jean Martin wanted to um, uh, take his ideas and uh, have a step further to uh, inspire uh, people of. Um, doing uh, really good ecological design. So the farm is really uh, has quite few um, projects in uh, that 
farm. Uh, it has some animals. It has a, a food lab. It has vegetable gardening, which uh, we see here. Uh, so it's really a laboratory for hands on learning and innovation in the field of small scale organic farming serving as a model for sustainable agriculture in Quebec, Canada, and beyond. So that's the idea. So it's it's kind of at the same time it's uh, an experiment, like life experiment, and at the same time it's uh, a commercial farm that will uh, that has, you know, uh, some profitability, uh, profitability to happen. So the program for today, uh, I'm going to say a few components of the farm, the market gardening and permaculture, where uh, is the sweet spot, uh, and uh, the master plan, that is uh, the permaculture master plan, the strategy that we adopted in the design of the farm, and the, the Q&A after that. So as I said earlier into that uh, farm, we have a bio-intensive uh, bio -intensive market gardens um, that are basically in the same framework as Jean Martin. Uh, the, the parcels uh, or the blocks as Jean Martin calls it uh, that you see there are um, uh, 40 feet wide by 100 feet long and uh, those blocks are going to be divided into different cultures. Um, basically there is a there, there will be a lot of mesclar like little greens uh, production in, into that uh, farm, but there will also be uh, probably a few um, a few dozens uh, different vegetables on the farm that is going to be produced uh, mostly annuals on those gardens. We got some pasture grazed uh, cattle, mob grazed. Um, so it's really uh, those are I don't remember the. The, the cattles, but the, the cattles are pa pasture raised for the milk, some for the meat. Uh, it's really more a marginal production since there will be 40 heads so or so in, uh, because the property is not wide enough to uh, have more cattle. There are some forest grazed pigs. Some pasture poultry uh, also that will be uh, as a mob grazed uh, like Alan Savory or other people showed the, the poultry we're gonna is gonna be uh, just after the cattle. We got some bees onto the property. Then we have some uh, perennial polycultures that I'm gonna speak a little bit today, but uh, not so much. We we just started um, like uh, some trials on perennial polycultures, especially edible flowers productions uh, aimed for the um, uh, edible greens, uh, mesclar uh, kind of mix. And there is uh, the food lab, and the food lab is really one of the interesting things happening there because there is a, a, a two chefs that are hired by um, uh, by the farm to uh, trying to find the best ways to conserve uh, the richness of the food, uh, of course all the tastes of the foods um, uh, during transformation, but also especially uh, the nutrients of the foods. So there is a really uh, a niche market um, of uh, transformed products that are going to be transformed right on the farm, uh, probably uh, one or two days after harvest and are go, uh, we're going to um, try to find uh, new ways to preserve nutrients in transform transformed products. Some of the, some of the, of the team, Jean-Martin Fortier on the left, uh, and uh, Mr. Desmarais, which is the Richmond founding the farm. Uh, we got the farmers, the farmers that are working uh, especially on the animal part, Permaculture team, our team of friends that we just hired for that big project uh, last year. Uh, the construction team, because there is a quite big infrastructure happening. Uh, excavation team, uh, that we uh, did dig the ponds, for example, with the excavation team. And the consultants, so Jean-Martin brings loads of uh, consultants uh, that are into organic farming, especially in organic farming in Quebec, uh, trying to uh, have 
you know, synergies between those guys and trying to inspire uh, with the work that we do on the Ferme Calcutta. So that's the model, the market gardener uh, of Jean-Martin Fortier. As you see, it's pretty small. It's uh, uh, what, you, what we see here is two acres. Uh, and Jean-Martin Fortier is able to produce, uh, I'm sorry, Jean-Martin Fortier with his wife, very sorry for you, Maud uh, so, um, so those market gardeners are able to produce uh, uh, for worth of uh, 1,600, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, $160,000 worth of productions per year in that two acre property. So that's really that's really the um, what's it's astounding about the market gardening and why Jean-Martin Forcier is uh, so famous here is that he has an economic model that works. And one of the things that is really interesting about this model is that as you can see that property is so tiny. It's really really tiny and, and this is one of the major constraints that Jean-Martin had uh, that is, from his point of view, the um, the best constra constraint that he had. So when you s go to visit those uh, vegetable gardens, uh, you see it's really it's so neat. Uh, no no space is left for anything like to grow wildly. Everything is so uh, well attended. So uh, that's really interesting, and that's why Jean Martin. Uh, really developed a model that is really, really efficient into the space, and that's why you can, uh, for example, in 4,000 feet so square feet, uh, produce uh, amounts of, uh, let's say, $10,000 tomatoes or uh, $6,000 mesclun, uh little salads. Uh, so that's really intensive system. Uh, it's really also a really efficient system. So that's the model that Jean-Martin developed and tried to scale up onto that Ferme uh, Carreta. Now for the Ecomestible, as we call it, just to... Ecomestible is my business that I co-founded uh, into back in 2012. Uh, eco means ecological and comestible means edible. So basically, eco-edible. Uh, if we ever translate the, the word, the, the name of, the, of our company. So I co-founded that business with an horticulturist. Uh, so we were, we were really into uh, the market, like residential market, um, doing, uh, in, doing edible forest garden inspired largely by the work of Dave Jakey with uh, the book Edible Forest Gardens, published back in 2004. And... Um, that was our scale at the moment. Basically, when we met Jean-Martin Fortier at the Permaculture Convergence of 2013, yeah, 2013, um, that was the, the scale that we had. Uh, we had a really little residential systems. Uh, the system that you see there is maybe um, 5,000 square feet. And uh, we were doing really wild systems that are really uh, attended by gardeners, uh, enthusiastic gardeners. And uh, we really wanted to scale up our business uh, to trying to make more profitable permaculture and making more efficient uh, permaculture that, that was aimed to uh, the economics of it and uh, you know the farming, the farming part of permaculture. So basically, we met Jean-Martin Fortier in that uh, permaculture convergence and uh, talked a little bit with him uh, about um, how permaculture could inspire market gardening. And uh, that was really interesting discussion uh, at that time. And then back into late, uh, like December 2014, uh, Jean-Martin just uh, called us. Um, to see, you know, guys, uh, just to tell us, you know, guys, I have a very, very big project happening. I really need you to uh, to come uh, on on that property, and it was really mysterious, and we were really curious about what was that project. Uh, it seems really big, but uh, Jean Martin was kind of uh, the mysterious man, and uh, he just uh, so so basically we just met up in the um, mid December. Uh, uh, 
and basically, Jean Martin is. Uh, uh, we, we went to that farm, uh, and uh, Jean Martin was like, "You know, guys, I have a uh, that rich man wanting want to uh, want he, uh, wanting to have that uh, commercial scale farm. He want new ideas. You want the best practices, and uh, so I have the economic model." And you have the permaculture part. So, what is the sweet spot between those two? And I really need you to make good design onto that blank page that was the farm at that moment, uh, and trying to find the sweet spot. So we have really we had that tension between like the very very neat aligned precise uh, market gardening, really efficient, and then the wild permaculture, uh, edible forest gardens that were um, really complex. So uh, we, so that was the uh, that was the goal at that moment of hiring hiring us. And then you have, back in the spring of 2015, a bewildered permaculture designer. That's me. Looking at that slope, southern facing slope, and it's like, wow, just what did we sign? In what did we? <laughs> so that was. That was pretty scary uh, at the moment because uh, that was our first project that was bigger than uh, any residential, re residential system. We had a institutional uh, garden that, that was made at that moment, but still it was far beyond of what we ever did at that moment. Uh, so yeah, we had some, some, some scary moments there. And there is the sweet spot that we made and I'm going to present, present uh, what did we find during that uh, design phase and implementation in 2015. Uh, merging the system of Jean Martin and not having all the constraint, uh, uh, I mean, space constraints. Still, it was pretty small for a vegetable garden. Um, and then having those permaculture ideas bouncing back, back into the design of the system. So as I tell in all the the workshop I give, the design process was built around constraints and especially land constraints. So so we had the uh, at first uh, we had um, to place those uh, those blocks produ production blocks into um, the space that was available for the market gardens and. Uh, we had that permaculture idea that uh, biodiversity can help us uh, to control pests, especially. So we just placed the different uh, elements uh, to have uh, a co coherent system happening there. So here is the master plan. Uh, those are the um, veg um, the market gardens, you have all the uh, wildlife habitat happening. Uh, you can see that on the on your left hand side you have the southern part of the gardens that are not established right now and on your right hand side you have uh, the northern part that are established right now. We're going to see some photos and you have the two greenhouses back in the bottom middle uh, you have some really, really great biodiversity happening on on the farm. We are in the southern Quebec, so it's even though it's the warmer part of the province, um, it's uh, also the part of the province that is not so close to the big cities. So it's not it's not really uh, well developed uh, in terms of. Um, in terms of uh, homes and land use, so we ha we have really interesting forested areas, and we have uh, some uh, artificial pond that was already there uh, into the middle. Uh, we did we dug some uh, additional ponds. You have all those corridors, as you can see, uh, natural corridors that are surrounding the farm. So we had that um, amazing biodiversity happening uh, just. Before you know, uh, before that we um, established a system, so that was a big, big um, plus for us uh, that all that biodiversity was there. We're gonna see uh, how did we did what did, what we did uh, with the natural forest management. 
So when uh, I talk about natural forces, uh, I'm talking about wind, especially wind and water. And what is what's in color is uh, are the areas that are uh, concerned by that strategy. At first, we presented Jean Martin with the idea of the, of uh, sun trap. So basically, uh, the, the you know the the thing in the I think it's permaculture one or designer's manual. The the idea that Mollison gave creating uh, microclimates with uh, windbreaks uh, that that would be oriented uh, north south. Uh, so that's the idea of the sun trap. And what you see in color is basically what creates that. Uh, that that um, microclimate that are um, aimed uh, to make the um, the blocks warmer, to extend the growing season, to have some wind breaks uh, happening between in between the gardens, and uh, all those areas are also sanctuary for beneficials, especially insects and birds, but also reptiles, also amphibians. We're going to see that later. And uh, so that's really the idea. The on the first draft that we did, uh, that we did, um, there was that idea to have like that, still very wild, um, you know, picking of fruits onto those areas. But Jean Martin really told us, you know, guys, I'm the one that's gonna, um, that is gonna like uh, make the commercial scale productions, and I have that if any. Um, production happen onto that system. I really need it to be really efficient. So I don't really need any like forest gardening uh, happening. I really need it, but I really need that uh, beneficials insects and birds happening into those gardens to reduce my pest pressure onto my systems. And that's really something that is going to have you know economical. Uh, returns if any pests uh, pressure is reduced. Here you have the plantation uh, on the north. Uh, just if we return here, the, the north is also on your right hand side, and you see all the the line of trees uh, surrounding uh, the, that are, that is planted basically east west and. Uh, that is for to block uh, or to reduce um, northern winds for from uh, winter. So these are trees that are on the north are um, really high standing trees. Uh, you have black walnut, we have uh, white pine, um, and on the south facing of that plantation you have some uh, trees that are flowering trees so we just basically apply the same logic trying to have that nectary calendar we're gonna see that a little bit later about the insect um, beneficial insect strategies and uh, so those are the flowering trees uh, basically to attract beneficial insects and that's how looked uh, all the plantation looked uh, back into the autumn uh, last fall in 2015, we're really uh, excited to see all those trees growing into the seasons. And the north, right now, is in your in your at your right hand side. Uh, so those trees eventually, I mean, pretty fast is gonna um, provide good windbreak for northern uh, wind that comes from basically in the northwest and a little bit from uh, north uh, in Hemingford. On the eastern side, um, we have some plantations that were uh, made uh, with the, the same idea for beneficials, uh, insects, and birds. Um, and at first, we really had that idea that it was going to be all about uh, something really linear. Uh, but as you can see in the next picture, uh, we had <laughs> at what moment? At one moment during the the design. Um, we uh, we just ask ourselves maybe hey guys you know uh, maybe that will be strategic to have uh, some uh, deposit zones for eventually like you know compost piles or mulch piles eventually into the system be because uh, is if you remember the master plan uh, those 
market gardens are really, really like close to each other, like the roads are, let's say, 10 feet apart. So the roads uh, are not designed for big tractors. They are really designed for uh, little electrical carts and uh, basically uh, manpower. I mean, just, just to walk into the gardens and that's what's so, that's what's make the system so efficient that you don't have access and access and access for machinery, you have access for manpower and then you have little access for little machinery um, to harvest. <coughs> and, and what is special about uh, the design that we did the, and, and the build uh, of le, the project at the Ferme Quatre Temps is, is that really we, we had that project that was we had to go fast. Uh, basically, Jean Martin hired us during the winter, and we did. We, we never saw the the site. Um, it was when we visited the site the first time. It was uh, all covered in snow, so basically we had to have a master plan happening uh, to put general ideas uh, together um, during the winter, and then starting the works. Uh, just into the spring when it was the first time that we really saw the whole site and uh, we saw all the dynamics of the water and wind. So, uh, so, so that's one of the things is that project was so um, fast-paced <coughs> Sorry, um, that we had lots and lots of adjustments uh, going on in the design because we were uh, doing the works at the same time in the design and we had really, really, really close uh, feedback loops between those two. So uh, just uh, to come back into the, uh, so the, that's the east uh, plantation and uh, we, we got some um, elderberries, we got wild crab apples, we have uh, some uh, hazelnuts, we have uh, lots of berries for the birds, so we have a, um, a calendar for different berries for the birds because uh, lots of birds eat insects, but they also need some berries. And uh, we have some uh, bushes like that, um, like that cedar, uh, North American cedar, uh, and Eventually, we have high-standing trees that are um, further from the gardens, not to make some shade. And uh, so that's really that idea. All, uh, the, all the ground is covered uh, with uh, wood chip right now, but we just sown a perennial mix of prairie. Uh, I mean, like flowering prairie, uh, in fact. On the so uh, southern part, uh, you have that plantation also uh, that is that is a wet area. We cannot see, but uh, near the wheelbarrow and the, where the, the guy stands, there's a little pocket pond that uh, captures the water. We're going to see uh, that strategy later. And uh, we have uh, still have plantations of uh, June berries, uh, rugosa rose or Japanese rose. Uh, we got some um, rowan. Uh, that are all for, especially for the bir birds, and again, uh, the um, perennial mix of flowers uh, sown into uh, as as ground cover. Uh, there was some plantation uh, uh, that we did on the west that was more like uh, aesthetical because it was really near the house on the property. Now, for water management. So what you see in blue is um, in the middle uh, and uh, on your right hand side is all that we, we all the, the things that we implanted it back in 2015 but then again on your left hand side uh, just after the greenhouses on the bottom um, is uh, what the gardens that are going to be uh, is is the garden that are going to be implanted in uh, this year, in fact. So for the water management, uh, the idea is that in market garden you really need like a um, low water table for uh, vegetable um, production to happen because they cannot tolerate. Uh, I mean, uh, lots of water into their roots systems. And in Quebec, we really have like the exact op uh, opposite problem that um, maybe most of the world 
has is that we really, really have too much water during the season, the growing season. Uh, we have some really um, uh, not not hard soils, but we have some clay soils. Uh, we have some really high water table, uh, especially in the spring. Um, for example, in uh, Hemingford, uh, Hemingford receives uh, in precipitation, so snow and rain about 1,300 millimeters per year. That would be in feet. Uh, that would be something like five feet. Um, 60 inch, uh, maybe five, uh, I think it's 55 inches or something, also, also, of uh, total precipitations. Um, some as snow, but lots and lots in as uh, rain during the summer. So we don't expect really hard droughts. Uh, we started to see some in Quebec, but it really doesn't have anything to do uh, with San Diego, with uh, Australia, or uh, as I heard in the news, like Venezuela right now. Uh, basically, when it doesn't rain for two weeks, we we consider it as a serious drought in Quebec. So, so for water management, what is done in farmland right now in Quebec is really like uh, drainage uh, to lower the water table. And we have we had to did to to do that uh, on the on that farmland to vegetable market uh, garden to happen, and uh, but basically we just as permaculture designers we just uh, told us basically why the problem sh uh, uh, wouldn't be the solution, why the um, you know uh, the drainage water wouldn't be uh, directed to ponds that are going to be interesting for beneficials. So that's what we're going to see. Yeah, yeah. So basically, you see the drainage into the roads that uh, are uh, aimed for uh, lower lowering the water table. A little bit further. And as you can see here, we're uh, looking right now into the south, and uh, you have that row. We have uh, really interesting uh, slopes. It's not steep slopes, but it's really interesting slopes that we can kind of juggle with uh, to have water management uh, or really interesting management. Uh, we're going to see a little bit later what you see each side of the road are the uh, hedges, flowering hedges, uh, with shrubs and flowers uh, specially selected for beneficials. So we have some ponds for water reten retention on the west side right now. We got some ponds uh, for especially uh, for the amphibians, especially toads. Uh, we're gonna see, be, uh, see a little bit later about those guys. And you see here the uh, the course or the um, direction of water, uh, surface water also. Coming from the brush pile, there is a, a drain right now, uh, right there, for the water table, and basically it overflows downhill. On the west side, you also have temporary uh, water retention, so lots and lots of different um, kind of size of ponds and uh, some te some uh, quite few temporary ponds, also uh, especially for the toads. One of the pond too, that is uh, one of the biggest uh, on the east side that collects all uh, what comes downhill from your left hand left hand side, um, and this is uh, especially for frogs. And it too, the east. Um, from the coming from the the east uh, the the east uh, that is your left hand side right here you see that dry stream that is this is so basically the water overflows and then sink into parts of the gardens uh, that are aimed at um, beneficial insects and shelter for birds and insects so and, and we don't mind at that place having more water so uh, we sink it. Uh, on those places, and when it's not really clear on that image is if you see at a bottom sander, you see that black plastic uh, pond, and and uh, you see that 
kind of brush pile into it, and it's it's uh, basically rel relays uh, for frogs and toads uh, to have shelter that that uh, extend their range uh, of uh, let's say work range, so they can kind of go from pond to pond. And uh, even even though it's really um, you know a little like just a little reserve of water, uh, they have to have their skin uh, really moist during the day. So it's uh, relays that are into the gardens to have a distribution of the amphibians happening into the gardens, so they can eat some quite some slogs and bugs. Looking at biodiversity strategy, when we counted the so what you see on your right hand side on the northern part that we established in uh, 2015, uh, considering all the roads and all also the two greenhouses that you see at the bottom center, uh, we have 23 percent of the total um, area that is dedicated to biodiversity, and we have 55% uh, production, uh, and the rest is almost uh, paths and roads. So that's really interesting uh, because we consulted uh, quite few agronomists, uh, and uh, we're starting to, to have some um, relations or, <coughs> sorry, uh, some um, research programs, and usually people don't invest as much in uh, biodiversity. And, and really the goal of that was, uh, was really to try it, like to go, you know, full gas, full fledged uh, biodiversity into that system, just to see what's going to happen. If if that you know if that uh, idea that permac uh, perm permaculture designer and uh, uh, you know uh, other people bring that biodiversity is is good for production. So we're gonna we're gonna try it right now. So as I just uh, talked a little bit earlier, that's the existing biodiversity into the system. Uh, we have really large forested areas, really interesting forested areas. Uh, we got some wetland uh, into it right in the center, uh, just just um, near the pond, and we have all those corridors uh, happening naturally hedges, uh, tree tree lines that are into that system. So that's really interesting for uh, you know all the beneficials to come from the outsides of the system or uh, other parts of the property in trying to um, build some homes, really interesting homes, shelters into the market gardening uh, system so that those beneficials will be active uh, hopefully into the uh, vegetable gardens. So, uh, regarding the strategy, um, we basically, I just have a, like a, a little excerpt from uh, the, the research that we did, is that we took basically based on edible forest gardens uh, models is uh, that we took the, um, the pests, uh, here the cabbage butterfly, and then we uh, just trying to find what those, what, what, the, what are the enemies, the predatory insect, the parasitoid insect also, uh, and also the, the birds that will eat the cabbage butterfly. So here we have, we just did find that some, uh, quite few birds from uh, northeastern America are really uh, fond of um, cabbage butterfly. So, so we built uh, some uh, nesting habitat, nesting houses for the birds, and uh, we selected uh, what kind of beneficial that we wanted to have in, uh, onto those hedges, flowering hedges, and also uh, uh, shrublands that we planted. At first, we so so that's at first the flowering hedges, as I uh, as I talked earlier, were kind of mixed of production, and uh, beneficial insects and birds uh, strategy, but then uh, we really aimed uh, that. Sorry, here. Uh, no, just. Yeah. Uh, so so and, and we really reframed. Jean Martin just reframed. 
uh, with us, uh, the goal of those firing hedges were was really full, uh, full scale or 100% uh, uh, beneficial strategy. So we took out few uh, interesting, you know, bushes just because it's not efficient to have uh, every few bushes out in uh, into those hedges and to harvest them uh, at com at commercial scale. Regarding met met methodology, um, we basically uh, did research into edible forest gardens and other sources. Uh, the main limiting factor of pred predatory insects and parasitoid insects are really uh, the nectary calendar. They really, 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 those guys really need to have um, uh, nectar sources. Uh, so that's really the, the first part you want to check into your system. Do I, do I have uh, always flowers going on onto my systems? Uh, is, that, is that near of uh, where my pest pressure is? Uh, so really, we planted the big bio, uh, big diversity of uh, different uh, flowering plants, and we have also a calendar for um, fruits for birds, uh, winter fruit for um, winter fruit for the birds that stays during the winter, and then uh, summer fruit, and then fall fruit for uh, the birds that are going to be um, to be migrating. So that's that's the model of um, the flowering hedges. We just uh, repeated that model 15 times uh, in between the market gardens, and it's really interesting because uh, it's uh, from what we know, um, not a lot of people tried that model to to have let's say flowering hedges every 40 feet, and we're really gonna see if that's of any use, you know. Uh, is that is that overwhelming? I mean, in terms of uh, predatory or parasitoid or birds uh, pressure on on the pest, is that working at all? So we really uh, repeated that uh, that flowering edges in between the gardens. Some details about the hedges constru construction. Uh, we had some topsoil removed to start the gardens. We just piled the topsoil uh, on onto mounds that are gonna accent, accentuate a little bit the uh, microclimate effect. It might be uh, very marginal, but uh, still. But we had the, all that topsoil available. We then planted. We uh, put some cardboard as a blocker for um, for weeds, and then we. It heavily mulch, and on the last picture you can see uh, when it's done, with some uh, brush piles, with some logs, and then with some rocks, pi uh, rock piles. A few of the hedges first year, so that's how that uh, how that looks. We we just sown uh, we sown in the fall. Uh, a perennial mix uh, consisting of quite few uh, nitrogen fixing ground, ground covers and also pockets um, pockets of different perennials because uh, quite a few of the perennials that we wanted to, uh, to sow uh, were not available as plants during a season so we just basically sow during the, uh, the, the fall so scarif um, not stratif stratification can occur and the seed will germinate uh, this spring. We had uh, some other biodiversity strategy for insects, for birds, bats, amphibians, soil life. So here you can see some um, insect houses. Insect houses, as we research, are re seems to be in the research that we consulted. Is the insect houses are interesting for some native uh, pollinators? There are no no research at all for um, 
predatory insects or parasitoid. And what is kind of, it's really a human way of seeing that interaction occur. So as I put it, it's really interesting like uh, 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 pedagogic, well, I'm sorry, uh, really educative, e educative uh, tool for people to understand what's happening there. So, for example, we did that house uh, with uh, some elderberries, some materials that were available into the hedges and into the systems. So those material uh, um, uh, are shelter sites for the insects uh, they are gonna lay their eggs, for example. So and, and it's kind of so so it's not on uh, something that is uh, obligated on any system. Uh, we have some check logs. And you have some rock piles, temporary ponds. Uh, we have some um, dead standing tree uh, for uh, perching uh, predatory birds, uh, especially for chasing the moles and vices, mices. And here are some natural enemies of our pests, flower flies, uh, uh, parasitoid wasps, and tach uh, tachinid is our uh, parasitoid insects that basically layer their eggs into soft-bodied insects, uh, when we talk about caterpillar especially. And some of them are really, really specialized, so some parasitoid wasps will lay their eggs only and only into the cabbage butterfly caterpillar, for example. And that's why we, they can do like massive and massive damage onto the pest pressure, uh, which is a good thing for us. And uh, But those guys, uh, they like chasing cabbage butterfly caterpillar like all day long, um, need nectar. And that's that's really important to understand. They, they really need that like fuel. Uh, like coke for in the in the, the party of uh, young uh, youngsters, you know. Uh, so they really need that nectar, and that nectar to that parasitoid or technid, for example, uh, they are really tiny, two or three milli millimeters long. Um, so they really need like tiny, uh, tiny flowers. For example, the umbellifera uh, family plant. Um, you have some lace wings too that are really um, uh, massive predators. Ground beetles, ground beetles uh, are uh, predatory insects. Uh, really generalist. They basically eat all. The, <laughs> uh, they, they, they eat all they can they can touch or uh, grab, and they can eat uh, their body weight per day. So that is uh, interesting because they are really large insects, and they really need like shelter where. Uh, there is no soil disturbance, and that's generally not happening into uh, larger market gardens or larger vegetable productions. The, the soil is always disturbed, and they cannot nest and uh, reprodu reproduce in, and do the, uh, in the soil. And, of course, the ladybug. What you see on your right-hand side is the... Um, the implantation of the different bird houses. Uh, so we uh, installed almost 50 bird houses into the the gardens. Uh, especially, uh, we we have three different old size uh, that are that will select for uh, uh, that will select for a really interesting species. Those species usually uh, don't nest into the uh, open grounds. Basically, these are uh, mostly uh, woodland insects, uh, woodland birds, sorry, and the 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 idea is that uh, when the nestlings uh, are are born, uh, the nestlings are f are fed exclusively from insects. So even the um, the the birds that are mostly like uh, that eats fruit will bring insects to their nestlings so they have they can have protein to uh, to grow and then to to be uh, to become mature really 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 fast so that's the general strategy for birds here you see all the posts for bird houses what it would would like we just we just installed a few weeks ago the bird houses. I don't have a picture right now, but that's basically the density of the bird houses. If 
for amphibian and reptiles, we have that dry streams that you see outlined in the uh, in the uh, white. And then, sorry for the French here, uh, <laughs> we have that uh, really really gentle slope, uh, 20 degrees maximum gentle slope, and that pond is especially uh, designed for the toads. We had a consultation with the biologi biologist in Quebec, uh, special specialized in uh, amphibians and reptiles and he just really helped us to uh, understand that toads are really in northeastern uh, uh, northeastern uh, America at uh, the very least the toads are really the, um, the best tough guys you know uh, that are gonna go into the market gardens and uh, that are gonna trying to catch all those pests and they don't need to stay in the pond all day long like frogs so that's why uh, we really uh, wanted to push uh, toad uh, into um, into that uh, uh, I mean near the gardens Some of the good guys that we uh, that the biologists uh, did find uh, some uh, some snakes uh, we uh, were really like uh, happy here to have uh, we have we don't have any venomous snakes so snakes are really not a problem in uh, northern I mean in in Quebec uh, it's really they can eat uh, quite few slugs. Uh, some of uh, one species uh, eat some voles and mice, <coughs> and the salamander that is more of a woodland uh, species. And we do spray compost tea. So basically, we uh, at the same time that we do bio biodiversity for uh, insects, birds, uh, providing shelter and food for those beneficials, we basically brew beneficials. Uh, bacteria and fungi and protozoa and, and nematodes uh, into our compost tea and we are really pushing that forward uh, this year with uh, Jean Martin in the greenhouses so we really want to have uh, that biodiversity happening on the leaf surfaces and into the soil need the roots uh, need the root system to uh, trying to achieve an equi equilibrium uh, in between the, um, the predators of your system, the good guys, uh, the good guys, bacteria and fungi. Here, spraying composty. And as the last word in biodiversity is, as I understand it, or as we designed it, is really the idea that biodiversity uh, brings resilience, and that's really the idea that we're trying to prove that we basically uh, quite few people uh, usually like believe it and we're gonna see if that works and that's that's the big claim of that the film and that's the big claim that Jean Martin wanted to to make uh, hiring us and uh, putting that system into production and uh, we know that his commercial scale system this this commercial vegetable production is profitable. Uh, we know that, and uh, Jean Martin is still really known for that. But uh, right now, we're gonna try and prove if biodiversity is, in the utilitary terms, is of any use. You know, is is that uh, if we can prove that biodiversity is profitable, if I can put it that way, uh, is um, is really providing services for the farmers. I think that we can score. Uh, really high with with that with those kind of ideas. Now, on other things that we did on the Ferme Calcutin uh, is perennial vegetables, herbs and spices. Uh, basically, when <laughs> when we met Jean Martin for the first time, uh, we were kind of trying to uh, throw 
all the permaculture ideas, cool permaculture ideas at Jean Martin uh, on the first meeting, and he was like, "Whoa, burn on vegetables seems in, seems pretty good, man. Really, really interesting. I want a full scale, full fledged report on my desk uh, in in uh, four to six weeks, and I want it to be professional looking. I want it to be." Uh, aimed for chef selections of species, and so that was our first experience of uh, making a report, uh, and it was really really exciting uh, talking and talking about perennial vegetables. Uh, so in in last year we had some really hard time uh, having some um, propagules, I mean uh, some some plants uh, of those really rare. Uh, perennial vegetables, and since it's really it's not easy to uh, cross the border, uh, U.S. border uh, with plants, we really need the, uh, uh, we only have those Canadians uh, plant growers, and uh, yeah, so so we are making some tests about perennial poly polycultures on Ferme Cretin, for example, um, Chinese artichoke, uh, Japanese parsley. Uh, Turkish rocket, uh, you have a bee ball for edible flowers, a skirret, you have sheep sorrel, uh, we have the one, you know, really interesting one, uh, that profusion, uh, profusion sheep sorrel that, it, that never flowers, so it's really, you can harvest uh, all, all summer long, it's really, really hardy and it's really productive. Um, and some woodland species to uh, native to um, to our part, to uh, southern Quebec, that are that were used. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, that would be American spike nard, I think, or a small spike nard. Uh, so it was kind of uh, used for uh, root beer production, uh, maybe a few hundred years ago. Uh, since they probably use more. Um, Synthetic uh, aromas, but we're gonna try to rediscover uh, forgotten uh, aromas and tastes, uh, especially with the food lab that is really interesting into those kinds of produce. And uh, regarding uh, the production of uh, perennial polycultures, as you can see here, you, we we ha we did have really really uh, kind of naive um, uh, naive uh, ideas about how to integrate that into uh, the gardens. We had some wild idea, branching patterns, contour patterns, um, leaf patterns, uh, like nuclei pattern patterns, and really Jean Martin at one at one time is was uh, kind of. Just uh, just told us, hey guys, you know, really interesting patterns for. Uh, but when we when we're talking about um, when we're talking about production, I really need to be really efficient. So I want it, uh, I want it to be in the same framework as my blocks. So uh, 40 feet bar, uh, per uh, 100 feet, and uh, we basically uh, made some. Um, put some ideas on paper, and then uh, just because we had really hard time to have uh, interesting um, vegetables that I showed you uh, a few slides ago, uh, we we had to implement trials. Let's say uh, 25 to 35 uh, of each plant uh, that are put as a trial um, into that system. So that's, and this year we're far more prepared. Uh, as I talked a little bit uh, more earlier, uh, we were really designing the, <laughs> the master plan at the same time that we were working into the site. So we didn't have time to prepare the, the ground for, uh, I mean, uh, prepare the plantings for the vegetable garden, uh, perennial vegetables. So we had really, really limited uh, selections of perennial vegetables, and it was in really limited amounts. And those, uh, for example, the skirt or the Chinese artichoke, are really hard to find in uh, great, great amounts. I say <laughs> I just called a few nurseries, like saying. Uh, can I have some Chinese artichoke? Yeah, 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 no problem. I would have to. Uh, I would want like 
3,000 of them. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's really hard to find. So we have a strategy here to reproduce some uh, this year into the gardens. Here you see some of the gardens. Once is planted, some mints, uh, lots and lots of uh, daylilies for the edible flowers. Uh, the trees that you see there is American linden. American linden for uh, some uh, bulk um, bulk leaves, edible leaves into the mesclun, uh, the salad mix. Uh, real interesting. I mean, it's some people could describe it as bland tasted, but I I find it this real interesting texture. It's a little bit, uh, it's soft and uh, interesting. So we're gonna mix that with the annuals into the salad mixes. You have some uh, honeysuckle vine for the edible flowers. So, so a lot of faces uh, into the edible flowers because the salad mix is really one of the staple, pro uh, not staple, but uh, uh, on the key product that is really high return on uh, investment. Uh, it's really an uh, interesting product. So the other plantation, some rhubarb, lots of scarab. Again, uh, bee bomb for flowers, uh, daylilies. So, Sorry, I didn't have sound. So, um, so yeah, that's that's about it for perennial vegetables. Uh, it's really interesting because uh, this year we we are really far more prepared for what's going to happen uh, into um, into the season. So we are pushing for um, having really interesting polyculture this year, uh, trying to uh, take. What are what is interesting from the tests that we established uh, into the perennial vegetable, and um, uh, to scale up that uh, uh, to scale up that production. Yep. I'm sorry. Just returning to the yeah. And we, uh, as Jean-Martin told, told us uh, at, the, uh, at first, that uh, quite few um, perennial vegetables, I'm sorry, it seems to be okay. Quite few perennial vegetables are um, quite profitable uh, in the in the in the market right now. But um, in we're trying to introduce new or forgotten uh, perennial vegetables. So, just to close, uh, what are the questions that arose from our, our first year is really are uh, perennial vegetables profitable and uh, are the biodiversity measures effective for the surface dedicated that's a big question 23 percent of the surface dedicated to biodiversity is that overdoing it uh, <laughs> some people seem to be believing that that's overdone uh, what is interesting on what we, we did is that we're gonna see uh, because uh, if the pest pressure is um, is down 90 percent or even 70 or 50 percent, that's real interesting uh, for the mar uh, because since pests management uh, takes time and takes uh, products, um, so re that's really questions that arose from. Our first year, I'm going to see in the, in the following years um, with some research programs uh, for uh, pre predatory uh, parasitoid insects versus pests. And we're going to make some uh, 
uh, assessment in, onto the fields, and also we're going to measure measure uh, the perennial vegetable production, uh, and we're going to measure also the weed pressure into perennial systems, just to see what kind of interventions are required to stay product produ productive with perennial vegetables. What are the good mixes? How to uh, be at the same time really productive, really efficient on the on the harvest, and at the same time trying to make make use of that idea of uh, perennial polyculture. Is there any way uh, to make uh, anything like uh, tree sisters, for example, for uh, the maize, the squash, and the beans? So I think quite few people just tried. Uh, real interesting ideas and we're gonna push that limit uh, a little bit further uh, with different uh, perennial vegetables uh, according to our climate so yeah that's basically what and uh, this year we're really uh, excited because we're um, into the uh, orchard uh, there's a little orchard and we'll e we will be um, opening the second part of the garden so yeah that's about it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was fantastic. Uh, a quick question for everybody. Do you guys want to see, we forgot to play that first video. We could do it like a 20-second flyover. Would you guys like to see that? Just let me know. I'll play, I could play like 15, 20 seconds of that. So let's check out this first video that we forgot to play. This is a nice flyover of the... Uh yeah, so this is... Uh, those are the gardens. It gives you an idea of the, of the volumes of the surface. So it's really, really, uh, you know, it's really... It's at, a, at the same time, it's tiny. At the same time, we can say it's scaling up the Jean-Martin uh, Forti system. Okay. Yeah, I think that was, good. that was a good overview. So, now we're going to open it up to questions. So, we have Jonathan available to answer questions, as well as Neil Spackman here, who's on the line as well. But John, can we see your video feed there? Uh, the videos from the gardens. Uh, just, just to, uh, <laughs> I know uh, doesn't work. Uh, ah. <laughs> I, 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 I just unmute my mic. Uh, I thought it would be okay, but um, um, yeah, the videos of the farm. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, I cannot really like put it public because uh, it's. Uh, even though you know that video is gonna be probably available offline, I mean uh, after that webinar, but uh, still, uh, it's because we have really, really strong regulations regarding of the drones here, and we we don't have the official permits to operate that. So yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm a little nervous about uh, getting any fines and uh, from the government. So and whenever you guys want, to leave, we'll just put it at the end of this. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I'm thinking at the end of this video, after the Q and A, we can we can re replay that first video so people who attend this can watch it at the yeah. the very end during the replay. Good. Awesome. So, all right. So we got questions here coming in. So from when? How does having such a big budget influence the design? Yeah, we we didn't really talk about the. Uh, the budget yet for this project, so I'm sure that's yeah. an important question. So, so from what I presented, just just regarding the gardens last year, uh, we we were talking about uh, half a million dollars. Um, uh, that's a lot of money. That's really a lot. And having a budget, uh, you know, when money is not is not. Constra is is a constraint, but not a constraint as we usually understand it. It's um, I don't know. It's it's it, it's special. It's it's special. We we had to go really fast, and uh, uh, that was um, 
like going fast is one of the the thing that makes you make uh, errors, you know, uh, mistakes, uh, and and that was understood like well by everybody, and uh, so I. Uh, I think that as all constraints into a design, that money constraint is really a good constraint. It makes you make smart choices, uh, makes you think, uh, makes you makes you think uh, longer. So, so really, it's it, it it was of course it was special, like like to have that big budget uh, happening. But at the same time, what is really interesting of that is really that uh, you you can. Uh, instead of trying to think and think and think, try to have the smartest, uh, smartest design. You can just try, try it, and that is interesting. And that is, um, you you just do it, and then you uh, bring people because it's it is it is so like um, inspiring or exciting. You bring people, even even though you know you you made mis mistakes and you made errors, and it's not the optimal design. Uh, basically, you just bring people around that project, and that, that's what we're doing right now. Cool. So that we we wanted as an exact question is what was the total budget of that project? Uh, so the total budget of the of the um, vegetable farm is for last year was half a million, but. Uh, I, I don't know the project uh, the the budget of the overall property and uh, since it's uh, it's there is a lot of choices that are made into the design of the overall property that are not uh, design uh, are not are not uh, just for production you know there is a lot of of it that is uh, for beauty for a sense of the place uh, there's aesthetical gardens there was uh, lots of renovation a lot of uh, uh, construction uh, into the buildings and it's really uh, it's really that those buildings even the barn and then the animal uh, animal barn and uh, is are really beautiful so yeah so I, I think there's there's kind of a scale that is is not uh, we're not used to uh, we're not used to in uh, commercial production. Cool. Next I'm going to jump in here for a minute. Can I do that? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Come on All in, right. Man. Sound check. Um, is there? Um, have you got some kind of control plot that you can measure the differences in needs for pesticides or? sprays or whatever way that you would deal with a market garden typically without these perennials on the borders. Have you got any kind of control plot where you can measure those differences? In fact, we don't. I mean, on the farm. We, we do have ideas from Jean-Martin, which is, uh, let's say, 50 to 60 kilometers further in yeah, the same bioregion. Yeah. yeah. So, so we have that. Uh, I mean, Jean Martin, uh, the, the the site is so small that uh, he knows what kind of pest pressure. What we're gonna do with uh, some scientific, we're we're trying to have a subsidy for. Uh, I mean, uh, like the um, Ministry of Agriculture to look at the system with the experts. And so, what we're gonna do is uh, from uh, first year, so this year. We're gonna uh, examine the pest pressure, make some uh, aspiration onto the leaves, uh, mm -hmm. having those uh, pests oh. uh, identified, and the same thing. Yeah. Keep going. Okay. okay. And the same thing is gonna be uh, done for predatory insects and parasitoids, just to see the evolution of uh, the, the parasitoid and um, um, uh, pressure onto the pests. Okay, cool. My only other question that I've got is to what degree are larger animals, because I, I understand the need to deal with bugs, um, but one thing that we're dealing with on our farm here in Saudi Arabia is that the birds themselves are the pests, um, and then I also imagine like groundhogs and some larger rodents being issues as well. How are you dealing with those? Uh, groundhog, we already had one response to some pressure establishing to the system last year, and that response was a shovel. And uh, yeah, from uh, some of the members of the team, 
and uh, we know that could that yeah that that's gonna that's probably gonna happen from groundhog for sure. For birds, from what we know and what uh, the bi uh, biologists that we consulted into uh, into Quebec, it we don't seem there is not a lot of research. It's really like in a forgotten forgotten realm of research, like birds interacting with agriculture. I mean, vegetable production uh, in berries. We do know that uh, birds are really smart ass. Uh, taking all of our berries, but uh, the idea here is providing so much food into the hedges, uh, so flowering and fruiting hedges. Uh, so the birds gonna kind of let you know salad grains and then cabbage and those kind of things uh, like alone. But uh, we're gonna see. Uh, yeah, and uh, from what we consulted, it wasn't much of a problem. But uh, all that we consulted was not the um, predatory actions of birds was the conservation of birds into agricultural agricultural systems and it wasn't at all ever uh, as dense as we did cool all right we've got we got a number of questions here on the side and me and Raleigh are marking them but what you should do Jonathan is they're marked as orange. Read them out loud as you get to the questions you want to address. Yeah. How did the uh, okay? So the budget we talked. How many feet do you need to run the uh, two-acre farm? I don't understand that question. Feet? FTA? FTE? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about it. Bob, if you can clarify that more, we'll uh, we'll answer your question again if if you clarify it. Uh, so let's move on to. What kinds of permeals do you use um, to bulk out your salad mixes? Uh, I cannot uh, I cannot answer directly in that question. I'm more the permaculture designer here, and Jean Martin is really the market gardener guy. Uh, so I really don't know about. Um, oh, I'm sorry, perennials. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. So uh, the perennials that we plant it. Uh, are really uh, basically aimed on uh, flowers, but it's really for the moment. It's really experiments that we're doing. Uh, only eight 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 thousand square feet were installed last year, uh, experimental vegetables, and lots of them were um, pretty. Uh, you know, not usual plants. Yeah, some plants that you go yeah, that you can find in uh, you know uh, conventional nurseries for edible flowers, for example, or American linden, for example, for the leaves. Um, but I saw another. Um, so, so a lot of perennials were really uh, difficult to find for us because you know the skirret or the Chinese artichoke. Uh, I I could find, let's say two to three nurseries in Canada that were growing it and I could find let's say 40, 40 uh, tubers, uh, 60 tubers, I needed like a few thousand of them so it, was, it wasn't it was at all at our scale and uh, as I um, explained earlier uh, we basically uh, designed built so fast uh, we basically had to plant those plants into the mid-July uh, mid and it was really uh, Jean-Martin wanted those things to happen uh, so 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 we basically installed some some things that weren't optimal, and we're gonna this year we're gonna install uh, way a lot more diversity and way uh, uh, quite few perennials that are really interesting: ca ca uh, Caucasian spinach, uh, few uh, scarab again, and then uh, Chinese artichoke, and we did find uh, those perennials. Awesome. So so Bob's quest. Bob's question that you asked is how many full-time oh, workers okay. would be needed to run that two-acre farm? Then I assume how much is it also going to take to run uh, 160 yeah. acres? Um, so, for, yeah, yeah. Uh, so at Jean Martin's property and uh, Modelaine, uh, so Jardin La Grelinette, which is the first farm that you saw, the two-acre property is two full-time plus one employee. Uh, basically, there's quite few um, stagiaires, which is uh, not workers. What is the stagiaire there? Uh, Contractors? Temporary? No, no. Uh, you know people that comes to uh, to learn, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, kind of like apprentices. 
Yeah, exactly. Apprentices. Yeah, so, apprentices. so there are okay. quite few apprentices staying for four to six to eight weeks. So uh, Jean Martin doesn't count them as as people working full time, uh, since they are learning and takes time to to show them how the work is going to be done. So basically, I think three people, uh, interns. Yeah, thank you, interns. Um, so three people almost uh, for to run the two-acre property right now onto the system that you saw that is going to be all planted. So the northern part, um, there there will be Jean Martin, and then there will be six interns, and that's it. But it, those are full-time wow. interns for all this all season long. They were uh, selected for especially for the project. Those people needed to have really a commercial project into their short-term goals, and uh, to have a solid background uh, into uh, uh, into environmental study, let's say, but also in uh, market gardening. But so uh, so Jean Martin hired six of them, and that's how they're gonna run the farm uh, this year. Yeah, and when just say Linden leaves for book salads, so of course, yeah, I just forgot that Linden is going to be used as a perennial, so uh, tree crop, a leaf crop from trees, for salads, and uh, we're going to try a uh, few other perennials also into uh, the, the mescler. Cool. All right, Chris is asking how many man hours you spent each week at the farm. <sighs> It's difficult. It's difficult to say right now because it's really the first growing season right now. Uh, I cannot answer that right now because uh, I, I know that Jean Martin has will have all the data uh, at the end of the year. But it's really that uh, what you saw. We had some uh, uh, green manures into uh, or cover crops into the into the vegetable garden. So th it was really installation. Um, so so I don't have uh, any data right now. All right, Bruce is asking how estimate for a time frame of the to maturity. Um, so uh, regarding the um, uh, parasitoid and parasitic insects, especially firing hedges, especially like uh, all the shrubberies that we installed with uh, flowering trees, flowering shrubs, etc. Uh, I think that a scale of uh, five years would be uh, would be more uh, not common but uh, you know normal to mature because quite few perennials were sown from the seed and here in the north uh, it takes almost uh, usually three full years before it flowers two to three full year full years uh, regarding the perennials that are more long lived I, it's sure that the white clover, red clover will will flower probably this year, uh, just after germination. I mean, few few weeks after germination. But uh, so uh, quite few of those shrubs were planted. They uh, may have some fruits in that, but uh, we'll have some that height happening into uh, all those hedges, providing uh, like little windbreak uh, in between the gardens. So I think in five years we're gonna have a really a more stable system. That we're gonna have uh, this year or the following years. Sort in Quebec. Is yeah. My bad. I, my idea was off. This is a pretty good question from Adrian. How did you purchase such a large number of plants that are uncommon in nurseries? Did you have to propagate these plants yourself? Uh, basically, we have uh, my um, the co-founder of Comestim. Uh, uh, Alexandre, which which uh, just just uh, left the business last year, and he's really concentrating into uh, perennial vegetables productions, plant productions like little propagules, uh, and, and he's propagating them for us. Uh, we're gonna do some propagation maybe last year because uh, then again uh, we had some issues with the design, uh, like uh, not having a final design before. Uh, all the um, all the uh, when the greener houses are started, so uh, we're gonna propagate maybe last uh, next year, and um, yeah, basically you really really uh, if you you are really serious into growing perennial vegetables or any perennial crop, you really want to propagate this yourself. 
uh, or to have a nursery or a large nursery that is going to have a good prices, it's interesting, but you really have like a volume discounts. And uh, yeah, so, but you do it by the seed or by division, but division it's difficult. Uh, you need to have uh, lots and lots of plants to uh, do it by uh, cuts division. Is Southern Quebec experiencing climate change? Is that pushing the need for adaptation and design? Yes. Yes. We, we do tend to see that uh, winter, uh, and it's it's not good for us because uh, we, we used to have lots of snow during the winter, and we do have lots of uh, snowfall. But still, uh, the, the temperature bounces up and down. So basically, the two last frosts that we had, uh, we had minus 27 and 28 degrees uh, in February with no snow at all onto the ground. So basically what what we uh, used to have is that the perennials, we could grow like zone 6. We're in zone four or 5 in Hemingford. We could uh, grow zone 6, zone 7 perennials because they were covered in snow. But uh, right now, as usually, we get some really hot weather like late January and uh, all the snow melts during the winter and then all the frost are really really deep into the soil and that's, that's really hard for uh, like uh, non-native or exotic uh, perennials so that's one thing uh, we do tend to see that there is more droughts but it's not really I mean we're, we, we, we just I, I don't know the numbers but I think we have 20 percent of any um, upground uh, uh, clear water reserve of, of, of into the world in Quebec so that's that's really amazing climate I mean I mean we see droughts but it's not real serious for the moment still in 2012 in my region like in say in in a in few uh, few dozen kilometers wide we had drought that uh, last uh, lasted uh, five weeks and people were I mean, we're crazy. Five weeks here is is kind of we never saw that. I mean, in, even in any numbers in the in the in the last hundred years, five weeks is like it's we lose other crops. Uh, all the farmers were buying water uh, with cisterns, and we we never we never did that. Usually, like I mean, usually um, big scale agriculture is uh, is never irrigated. We we don't water any plant in big scale agriculture in Quebec, and and so so. People are not prepared. Uh, quite few farmers have um, have uh, irrigation ponds, but I, this mentality, as new, in, in New Zealand or Australia or in uh, Saudi Arabia, is is not is not there yet. And we might uh, we might have to uh, promote that uh, for what's coming. So. The range of annual income do you expect for uh, with your farm model? Okay, so that's not my numbers. Those are Jean Martin's numbers. I mean, with Monsieur Desmarais, he uh, expect in uh, let's say uh, in five years to do a million dollar per year. So it was it was uh, six hundred thousand gross. Uh, gross, gross. No, gross is not. It's not gonna say it's gross. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was expected, uh, but then they they kind of raised the bar, um, and uh, yeah, Jean Martin is up to the, he's um, really uh, taking the um, challenge, you know, to make a million dollar onto that like six acre ish something, the six seven acre or so when it will be all opened, all uh, vegetable gardening, especially uh, aimed at chefs markets into the state of New York. So we're not we're really close to New York. We're 15 kilometers from the border. Uh, so so it's really with a high income. Uh, I mean I uh, profit onto uh, really niche markets, really niche products. So that's the idea. That's how they are going to do a million dollar. And also, there is that idea to have, um, uh, f um, like, let's say, a prestige CSA for a few people. So a prestige CSA that would be all products, fresh product, but also transformed products, really niche products for uh, uh, rich people. That there is that idea uh, coming from uh, Monsieur Desmarais. 
uh, that it, that basically just uh, went to see uh, his friends and proposing like prestige CSA, which is <laughs> which is kind of interesting, which is kind of funny. Um, what are uh, all the projects are being sold? Yeah. Uh, so farm stand, it's not. I don't. I don't know if there's go there are going to be uh, any farm stand, uh, but I know there's going to be. Uh, way more uh, like a chef market into New York, and I'll have more details right now. They are really into, um, uh, they are still into like the phase of uh, finding the finding the markets or uh, the um, yeah. So, and it's wholesale. Just to to uh, it's not wholesale. It's uh, what we call semi gros. That would be half big or something. So it's not. It, so it's not like little bunch of carrots. It's Carrots aimed for chefs, so uh, let's say uh, per ten pounds or so, but it's not wholesale. What program do you use for your plant layout? Uh, if you want to have a good 3D uh, landscaping, I recommend Real Time Landscaping Architect. It's four hundred dollars. It's really cheap for if you if you compare to other products. Uh, Real-time landscaping architect really interesting, and it's basically your design at the same time that you design in two, uh, 2D. It's in 3D. Uh, you can use control lines and all kind of stuff. It's really good, good, uh, good software. Are animals integrated into the system? Is there any animal destination for meat or egg productions? Yes, uh, meat and egg. Uh, what is their own design? So, um, just to look. Look, uh, look up or look at uh, more uh, macro scale. We didn't, as permaculture de de designer, uh, had the chance to design the whole property, which would have been really exciting. But th that's not. Jean Martin was really like the uh, the person responsible for uh, the market garden. So basically, we con concentrated uh, the permaculture design ideas onto those. That's uh, why we don't see like. Um, uh, that's why we don't see right now in the master plan integration with uh, animals. Uh, basically, the farmers are um, doing um, not Alan Savory, the other guy. I'm sorry. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, with the chicken and the, yeah, Salatin. Thank you. So Joel Salatin inspired um, system. So, but uh, at the same time, we're gonna. If if I can point out like that kind of a synergy into the system is that the cattle is going to be uh, during the winter, which is kind of long, like let's say four to five months here, long winter, that we you cannot really graze anything. Uh, those cattle is going to be into a barns, and we're gonna make some really good compost. I uh, I was um, I was formed I was uh, made some workshop with the uh, Inningham. And we're only into composty and quality compost production. So for especially the market garden. So we're gonna try. We're gonna try. And, we're gonna try to close the loops. You know. Good. Awesome. All right. Fantastic. I mean, if anybody else has any, any questions, let me know. But I wanted to show you guys. So if you want to see other examples of Jonathan's work, there's a site right here, Ecomestable. I'm saying I'm saying that really wrong. How, how do I say say your company? Yeah, name? it's not it's not really it's Ecomestible. Ah, Ecomestible. <laughs> right, right. I, I'm just slaughtering the French words. <laughs> right, and uh, if you want to see more about the um, the farm, there's their their website is up here. And la, la, gosh, all right, la femme de quatre temps. Uh, yeah, it's almost, it's, it's almost that. La femme de quatre temps. Awesome. And I'm just gonna post the. Uh, I forgot to send you the film. Quatre, yeah, there you go. Oh. Awesome. Well, I posted I, in the. Uh, Facebook, great. Let me just get this up there real quick. Great. Well, that is up there. So now, uh, before we go, let's open it up. Does anyone have any, anyone have any questions for Neil Spackman? 
But before we do that, um, I want to thank Jonathan for coming on. This has been really interesting yeah. stuff. Um, I hope we get some good data out of your farm out of the next few years. Because in so many cases and in so many environments, we've got all these great ideas and so few trials on scale, right? So it's great to see the work that you guys are doing. It's really fantastic stuff. Thank you. So thanks for coming on, Jonathan. I'm really excited about what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, John. You Thank rock. You, thanks so much, man. This has been a huge pleasure. Um, I, I see someone, uh, Vincent, in French, is basically wants me to talk about Ramiel Woodchip. Uh, you said that all that uh, woodchip into the, uh, the, uh, the, not the gardens, but the flowering hedges and all the plantations that we did. Um, so he's talking about like that old conversation about like um, what we call here um, uh, uh, swef. Uh, oh yeah, man, that's sorry, I'm beginning to be here. so. So basically, that the uh, wood chip would take all the nitrogen available into the soil. Uh, there's a there's there's an expression for that. I don't remember what it is in English. So yeah. Um, the studies that were done with the wood chip, especially in Quebec, in the Ramiel wood chip, which is the wood chip from the uh, no, like the branches no bigger than uh, three inches diameter, uh, is really you have that nitrogen like uh, took up by that woody material when it when it's um, it's really uh, mixed into the soil. When you apply it as mulch, we did see that. It seems, it seems to us that when you apply, let's say, two to three inches, uh, Ramiel wood chip. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so that which is is binding the nitrogen when basically you uh, mix it with the soil, but when it's applied as mulch, is not that much of a problem. When uh, uh, for us we do have some really really great um, uh, uh, um, in, uh, not incomes but uh, results uh, with the perennials. Uh, when we do plant it with uh, with the trees, we don't see nitrogen as any limiting factor. We see the fungi as a, uh, as a limiting factor. We see uh, that uh, carbon uh, soil carbon uh, as a limiting factor for perennials and for uh, trees to grow. So uh, basically, what we did is uh, we did put some quite few uh, Ramiel wood chip into uh, or perennial plantings. I wouldn't recommend it uh, like heavily into market gardens. Maybe that would be interesting to do some trials with uh, Ramiel wood chips from poplars, which are uh, recognized as a free living nitrogen fixer. And uh, also with the salix, that would be uh, the willows. The willows also are fast growing, uh, higher nitrogen uh, than uh, oaks, you know, or maples. So that could be interesting to use it as mulch, but I never did any trials or I don't have any studies to show. Cool. Okay, Jonathan, thank you. I can't thank you enough again, man. That was fantastic. So if um, one sec. anyone wants to check out our other classes uh, that we've put on, oh, this offer is going to be terrible. <laughs> Darn it. Well, anyways, uh, we have our, our site, sustainabledesignmasterclass.com. If you want to see our previous episodes, we've got one with Sepp Holzer. Uh, Oh, yeah. Sepp Holtz's apprentice, Zach Wise, and our first one was with Neil Spackman about desert terraforming. So definitely check those out. We'll post that link at the end of this. But Jonathan, you've been amazing. Keep on rocking in Quebec, and thank you so much. <laughs> thank you guys for uh, inviting me into your webinar. That was a great first time for me. It was really great to meet you guys in the back in PV3. That was my first time as a in a, a permaculture entrepreneur uh, oh, event, and uh, that was so exciting. I uh, hope that uh, we're gonna have uh, uh, other um, you know uh, other opportunities to meet again. 
Yeah, absolutely. It made me realize, like, man, I wish I knew French so I could come up there for a few months <laughs> at a time. I could tell those French jokes. Yeah. <laughs> sure. All right, before we go, does anyone have any questions for Neil, who's left in the, the chat room? I was just going to say that we're, we had a few plans related to the webinar where we keep hitting brick walls about not being able to get, get, get good data uh, regarding some of the scenarios we wanted to bring to you folks. So uh, I'm, we're going to be sending out an email in the next 24, 36 hours on uh, some future plans, but keep an eye out for that. And thanks to all of you, all uh, all 50 ish of you who are still around after two hours. That's yeah. fantastic. Um, yeah. So thanks to all of you. We really would appreciate uh, feedback because we're trying to tailor all of these to the things that are going to help you move forward in your own path. Um, and the more feedback we get, the better we can make this. So thanks to all of you uh, for spending some time with us. Yeah, That's fantastic. All I've got to say. Thanks, everybody. All right, so we'll close it out. We'll play the last video we forgot to play. This is the flyover of the, uh, the farm, the fem. Oh, can't even say it. The fem de quatre attempts. And yeah. <laughs> have a great day, everybody. Keep doing amazing work. Design a better world. So here we go.